Okay, we're going to bring up our next speaker, who is Rob Havard. We're grateful to have him. Appreciate you being part of this group here. Rob, where are you from? Where are you zooming in from this morning? Uh, hi, Jared. It's, uh, yeah, we're here in sunny Shropshire at the moment in England. Um, so coming to you across, uh, across the Atlantic. Awesome. What time of day is it there? Uh, it's 6 p.m. Okay. So it's just okay. getting into a nice summer's evening. Very good. Very good. Well, man, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, let's, uh, let, yeah, we'll just jump right in. Jump right in. Your co-host, you can share if you've got a presentation um, or okay. just run with it. I'll just share the screen. Yes, sir. We'll get going. Okay. So sixth generation farmer, professional ecologist. Looks like you learned from Kirk Godzia. Kirk's been on our place. He's a... He's a great one. We're going to work with uh, Kurt Gadzi uh, back in 2014 or 20. 20- yeah. Fabulous, yep. fabulous trainer. Um, how's that? Can you see that? Yep. Looks like it's coming up, Rob. There we go. So I will. Yeah. You just. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, so today we, yeah, we today we're going to be talking about um, breeding functional fertility in grass-fed cattle. I'm sure most of the people here today are breeding for regenerative systems, and so I'm going to focus on that rather than talk too much about breeding in conventional. Um, a little bit about myself: uh, I'm an ecologist and sixth-generation farmer from Worcestershire in England. Uh, we run about 150 pedigree Angus cows to the bull each year. Um, and we've taken the farm using holistic management from that training with Kurt Gadzia initially in 2013-14 from 50-acre home farm. Um, and with the rental land that we have now, that's up to 1,000 acres of diverse pasture. And we are organic, certified organic as well. And also with the uh, Pasture-Fed Livestock Association, which is a, an association over here. So um, getting right into it, what do we want from a cow or a ewe, the sheep, if we're breeding those? In regenerative system and for us uh, we're cattle farmers so we want a marketable calf every year on time problem free um, you know this can be achieved with input inputs or without but one comes with a lot of cost and not much reward and it really depends on what your goals and context is is how you're going to manage your system uh, but essentially if we're in rege regenerative systems we want to be simple as simple as we can so really important for us before we start is to define your whole under management. You can see a picture there of one of the hills we graze um, in the UK. It's on the Kemerton Estate land um, and uh, beautiful pasture away and you see the sun there. So we want to focus on our solar dollars rather than paper dollars. So everything the sun and the rain provide from up above, we want to make the most of that. And we want the maximum sustainable profit, not the maximum production from what the environment can provide. And, and there are a lot of people in these systems will claim that we can uh, you know, max out stocking rates and have really, really high stocking rates compared to conventional systems in terms of stocking rate. And uh, that tightrope of absolutely producing on the balance between what the environment can provide and what our cows can produce. We don't want to get those two things misaligned. The whole in the management in terms of the environment is limited. Uh, Lots of wonderful positive stories in the conference about how we can increase production and how we can get nature working for us. That's fantastic. But at the end of the day, there is going to be a maximum production level that we reach. And I think pushing beyond that is where we've always got into trouble in terms of our agriculture. Uh, we can increase the available environment over time with our good management. There's still a limit. Um, so what's the risk of relying on good management? The risk of relying on good management is if your cows rely on that good, good management, some years it doesn't matter what your management's like. Some years it really doesn't matter because you can have a three or four month drought that just changes everything. And never mind how you manage it, it changes what's going to happen with your cows and raising those calves. And so if you've got cows that cannot cope unless they've got 
perfect management and then they get an environment shock or a climate shock coming into the system, then you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have empty cows. You're going to have open cows that are not bred and you're not going to have enough calves on the ground the following year. So it's better to rely on um, your genetics, on genetics can, that can cope with whatever the environment is going to demand of them and whatever the environment produces. A lot, of the, a lot of people will tell you that cows can do anything. They're cows. They, they're going to sell you. They'll do anything. They'll, they'll grow the most. They're going to be the most maternal. They're also going to be the most terminal. They're going to have the most muscle, but they're also going to have the most milk. Everything. You name it, they've got it. But we've got to work within the laws of physics and just, just don't fall for the marketers because it, that's going to end up in trouble, particularly in a limited environment where you're only going to produce a certain amount of forage every single year. So we can't break the first two laws of thermodynamics. The first law is that energy can transform created nor destroyed. So we can't create energy out of nothing. This is in a closed system. So we can bring, if we unclose that system, we can bring more energy in. You can buy inputs and fertilizers and feed. That's if you need more production. That's if you need more energy into the system because your cows can't survive in the environment. The second law of thermodynamics is that entropy is real. And entropy, the reduction in energy available, because it takes energy to convert uh, from one form of energy to another. And so it, or not only do we have a limited amount of energy available to us each year, we're also going to use some of that up when we convert from sunlight into growing plants uh, and so on and so on. So we have to make sure that we're operating within the limits of the environment and our cows can do the same. And now the laws of physics apply to closed systems, I said, and a brief production isn't closed. So you can bring some more in, but that's gonna cost you. And we wanna keep our, our costs as low as we possibly can. We can measure these increases in energy input through the animals that live within the systems. You can see growth rates increasing, weaning rates going up, milk production increasing, conception rates higher, more and more uh, traits that we're all trying, you know, people are aiming for all the time. But if we're having an increase in every single one of those traits, then that energy isn't free. It's coming from somewhere. And the price of energy in all its forms is increasing. And we have to be really careful about what we do with the energy costs of our cattle because that's going to cost us in our back pocket, in our bank account, if we're not careful. If we chase every single trait to get the maximum rather than try and get balance between them. So it's really important for us that we have cows that work for us and not we're not working for the cows. So the costs are not going down. We need to keep those on track or we're going to be out of business pretty quickly. We don't worm our cattle with wormers they routine, and, and they only get native grasses, no high sugar varieties that need reseeding every few years, another cost that comes in. And inevitably, this means we end up often with smaller cows to cope with this environment but it does mean we keep our direct costs as low as possible. And then any margin is going to be working for us. All of our cows are wintered outside. Even in our wet winters over here in the UK, we can manage that using holistic grazing, as shown to us by Kurt Gadzia and working with uh, other consultants that have come over from the States as well. Um, many of our cows have never been in a shed. There's no dry bedding, high quality conserved forage. When they're in driving rain and cold, wet winter, days that turn into weeks of wet, wet weather. And, and you know, I've got friends over there in, in Canada uh, and the US, and I know that the winters can get really cold. I know in Canada, there's a good friend, Aaron Nervas, getting down to minus 30, minus 40 with the wind chill. Um, but actually, if you get three weeks of sideways rain and you've got, you're about just above freezing, that can be actually worse because the dry cold cows can work with but the wet cold really pulls the energy out of them. And so we do have quite a big challenge in that way in trying to get cows that can, um, that can cope with that. But probably the biggest challenge we place on our cows is carrying their calves through the winter. We, we, we wean at 10 months, about March, and that's hopefully onto growing grass in our climate. So the calves can then grow on and move away and, and the heifer calves in particular get ready for breeding in August and then we're calving in May. So they get the cows get 60 days off, just like a dairy cow. We're not giving them this long break. Uh, we should be asking this of our cows. They should be working for us. There you can see one of our bale pods. So that's just 
where we've got stored hay ready for winter. We use that in snow. We use that in really wet weather where we don't want to be pugging and poaching up the ground. Um, and so we have a big animal impact there. Our calf pairs, which we wintered there until March, um, did a fabulous job for us. Wintering cattle out all year, also great for the wildlife as well. Um, cows doing really well. And I think the key thing for us to look at is that we're looking within within uh, the holistic management framework, something called community dynamic adaptation to the environment, the epigenetic change that comes, and then the evolution of the herd. It's the herd that's adapting, not the individual. And a lot of pedigree breeding is based upon looking at the individual animal focus, but we want to look at the community dynamics and the population dynamics of our own herd. And that, that's evolving as a whole. So we've got to look at the whole whole thing as an organism. And when we're adapting to that whole environment, this wheel here is from a guy called Jan Bonsmore, I'll talk a bit about later. But all of these different things we're looking at, rainfall and humidity, soil fertility, pH, parasites, disease, wind, atmospheric pressure, altitude, light, all of these things have an impact on the animal and they're adapting to it all the time. And so in terms of how we then achieve adaptation, And you look at all of the, over here is certainly a tradition there's that a lot of the pedigree and seed stock um, magazines and the, and the marketing materials, all about the bull, always. And essentially the bull really just for us anyway, just passes on the genetics, either terminal or maternal. For us, we're, we're totally maternal focused. So it's just passing on the genetics of, of its dam. And if you think what the cow does for you, for us anyway, it carries a calf for nine months while feast it, feeding another one for 10 months. And she's the physiological center of production on your farm. She's the receptor and the interpreter of all environmental signals on your farm. She has to adapt to those. And essentially that's how everything, that's how the herd adapts to the environment they, they have every year. You go and buy a bull from somewhere else. It's been on your property for six months. You put it in with the cows. It's not had any time to adjust to the environment, but the cows are the organism that do that for you. So we didn't focus on the feminine. We, we focused on the on the masculine, on the bulls. And, you know, something that we I used to hear as a kid growing up and granddad, you know, the bull, we used to say the bull's half your herd. Um, you know, if a bull covers 30 cows, the assumption was that 50 percent of the relevant genetic material was from one individual and the remaining 50% was split between 30 individual cows. So it looks like it has a much bigger impact on, on the genetics of the animals. And that's come from Delian segregation, uh, Mendel's laws of segregation. 50% um, of the genetics come from the male, from the female. That's what we've always believed. Um, and because of that, cattle geneticists, and people breeding abandoned the importance of cow families in selection. And cow families, you'd speak to um, a cow man, a woman who's kept cattle for a long time, and they always knew that this cow family, for some reason, this works on my place. Um, but that was thrown out because we, you know, with that into her. It's going to come from the bull side. That was the conventional wisdom. But as we found out more, we actually, we weren't quite as clever as we thought we were. The farm has to live within the herd, the environment, the wind. Hey, Rob. I'm not sure if anybody else is having trouble <laughs> hearing you. Rob, I, I wonder. I wonder if you cut your video until the end maybe that'll help your bandwidth to, to so we can hear the audio a little bit better okay if i stop uh, the video you can still see the screen share yes we can yep okay great okay i've turned the video off so hopefully that'll help okay thanks quite a lot to get through so i'm just gonna i'll, I'll keep pressing on yeah you got about 15 minutes yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yep, we're yep, we're good.
We'll make sure all the other devices in the house are turned off, and then hopefully that might help. Okay. Yep. I think we can hear you better now. Thanks. Okay, great. So epigenetics is a really important part. And that, that is the definition of that from the Greek comes from over or above genetics. And it's changes in the organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than a change in the genetic code itself. So this is the thing you might hear about, about certain genes are switched on or switched off. Now, it might take three hard winters to really switch on different genes within an animal within its lifetime. And we've actually seen cattle's hides thicken. We bought cows from, from operations that housed their cattle for six months over winter in a shed. They're very thin hided. But then um, after three, four years, the hides on those cattle really thickens up uh, and really helps uh, for them to get through our winters outside. Uh, even within, um, you think also about how much switching on and off of the genes can have, can impact on an animal. If you think about when a, an embryo is fertilized, that becomes a blastocyst of about 8, 16, 8, 16 cells. They're all identical. Every cell's identical. It has the same genetic code within the nucleus, in the DNA. And yet each of those cells will end up being completely different. One might be part of your big toe. One might be part of your... Uh, your eyeball or a valve on your heart, and they'll have completely different expression just depending on which genes are switched on and switched off. That has a massive impact. And we actually see that within life as well, within ourselves. In you drink too much alcohol for three or four weeks, you'll actually switch on some genes that start producing an, um, an enzyme that actually helps you to process the alcohol in your liver more. So thank goodness for epigenetics. And if we look at the energy requirements and also in terms of the metabolic efficiency and the fit to the environment, then obviously the epigenetics is really, really important for that. And, and in terms of that, we also have to think about within the cell, not just the DNA, but also the mitochondria. And they actually help us transform ATP or all the food that we eat into ATP for energy of the cell, they control the regulation of cellular metabolism, cell death, the production of steroid hormones, um, regulation of innate immunity, our immune systems, um, growth and repair of body tissue, um, and peptide production, the chains of amino, amino acids that form proteins in the body. So in terms of the muscle growth and all of that sort of stuff, there's loads of really important things that happen. And that's all controlled, not just not by the DNA in in just in the nucleus, but the mitochondrial DNA that sits within the cell. And it's a really important learning point here, which is that the DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, actually has some special qualities that help with adaptation because it's got a higher rate of genetic mutation leading to faster rates of adaptation. But here's the thing, 99% of mitochondrial DNA comes from the female, not the male. So when, as soon as we learn this fact, we realize how important the feminine inheritance is from the female line. Cow families are absolutely back in terms of what we understand now because we know they're the thing that's, in, that's actually interacting with the environment on our property. And so we need to have those and the, and the lineage from our females is, is absolutely vital if we're going to have adapted cattle. Um, and then we come on, we have a look at, this is one of our cows as a heifer. She's one we've picked out. She's really well uddered. She's very feminine shoulder. Um, and we'll go a little bit, talk a little bit about structure later on. Um, but she's one that we pick out on structure and we can see how she might perform for us. And she's a, she turns out to be a first cycle breeder every single year for us, bring us a calf every year. And so we come back to the environment, the adaptation to all of those things on Bondsman's wheel. Um, and and at, Another part of this is understanding that we're all anti-fragile. And this is a definition by a guy called Nicholas Taleb. So an anti-fragility anti is a property of systems in which they increase in capability to thrive as a result of stress, essentially. And so biological organisms need stresses in order to adapt and become stronger. So if we never encounter as babies and children peanut butter, then we're going to get peanut allergies. If we use bleach around our home and we kill every bug that we might ever encounter and don't let the kids play in the soil, then we're probably going to have 
allergies and we're probably going to get a lot more colds, coughs and colds and things like that. Um, you know, in terms of crutches we provide for our animals, we're taking those um, environmental stimuli away when we use vaccinations on them, uh, when we actually provide additional feed so they're not actually interacting with the available resources of, of the environment. You know, and what can a cow actually stand? We don't find that out if we're supplementing all the time. So many of us in the grassroots sector accept that we want to produce within the bounds of what the environment can produce sustainably. And so within that relatively fixed supply of energy, we need an animal whose energy requirements, this is really important, they fall within what the environment can produce. That keeps our costs down and it means that it's almost a walk in the park for her to have uh, to be able to produce year in, year out for us, always bring us a calf. That's going to increase your margins over time. So for us, in terms of what we want from a cow, again, we said a marketable calf every year, on time, problem free. Fertile, she gets in calf first cycle every time. Maintains conditions through the winter while in calf and with a calf at foot until it's 10 months old. We want her to calve correctly, pair bond, but still be approachable. And we really want her to clean her calf. So that mothering ability, if she doesn't clean her calf properly, then that's when you're going to end up problems. You're going to get scours. Um, you're going to get, you know, coccidiosis, diarrhea in the calves. You know, you shouldn't. That's a big part of, as well as new forest eye, or what you call pink eye over there. You know, if a cow starts to see her calf, and, you know, the eye starts dripping and you've got some fluid in there, she should be keeping that eye clean. So having a cow that cleans a calf is absolutely key in terms of behavior. And if she raises a marketable healthy calf, in good body condition every year easily within what the environment can provide. And then the danger of chasing production for the individual to get a bigger calf or a bigger cow to get more production on the individual is that you then end up with a cow that cannot stand your environment. So here's the thing, if you want more production, the simple answer is keep more cows, but keep more cows that can cope with your environment rather than changing your cows to a cow that can't cope with in, with your environment. Um, I'll just go We've got about one. just over five minutes left, Rob. Yeah. About six minutes left. So if we're gonna maybe take one or two questions here um, you, or wrap things up, we'll take maybe one or two questions and then share your contact information. Sure. No problem at all. Yeah, I'll just I'll just finish off with saying that some of the data I'll just skip through some slides and we'll just have a look. So just a bit of heifer development there from going from um, 11 months to 19 months and see that change. Uh, and then I just want to show you um, in terms of a guy to look up is a guy called Jan Bonsma. Um, and if you look at his monitoring and selection, and if I pick out a couple of things to show you to look out for in your in your cows, and that's is to look out for the feminine and the prominent shoulder. You can see that on the cow there. She's got you see it's above the top line. It's above, and that means that her reproductive hormones were dominant over her growth hormones in the skeletal formation. And if you can do that, that and and you have a look through your heifers and you have a look through your cows and you and your regular breeders, that'll make a big difference. And the last slide, I'll just say, with all our cleverness and all the advantages that we have with technology, um, and yet, if we go back to the first cow that was in the Abbey and Angus uh, herd book, it's called Old Granny, um, and she uh, had a calf from the age of two every year until she was 27 years old. So in all our smartness and our cleverness that we think we can work things out, I ask the question whether we've actually gone backwards since the first cow in the herd book. And if you have a look, mm. you know, if you have a look at that, you, you might think that she needed to be culled a bit earlier, but I think they kept her on until she was 33 from what I understand. Um, so I wish you all the best in your breeding for the future. Breed for functional fertility, breed for problem-free cows, and you can't go far wrong. That's wonderful. Yeah. Very, very, very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, Doug has a question. Doug, if you want to unmute, if you're able to, if you're still there, um, might be good because I think you you have a uh, kind of a relevant one. Maybe it was answered during the presentation.
Yeah, you should be able to start back up your video now. So his question was about epigenetics. Um, uh, environmental shock is the main reason we use home-raised genetics. What epigenetic effects have you noticed over the years? I think one of the key things is is buying, there's not many cattle over here that are outwintered. And so initially we did encounter a lot of people will trim their cattle's feet because they're in a, in a on soft bedding over winter and the, and the hoof will grow out. And we, we initially, when we started out with the program, we had some foot problems. But I think what's really interesting is to see that now we, we never touch an animal's foot. Uh, we just don't get um, problems with hooves. If there's a lame animal at this time of year, it's always usually to do with uh, a bullying injury. Um, something like that where they're riding each other um so yeah i think it's you, you can just see the impact of the environment of outwintering on those cows really helps them with their feet and they adjust over time i mentioned cow hide as well um but i think that's it wintering and and the other thing is learning to graze so there's people will probably talk about some of the grazing seminars on here that you know in terms of cows change their behavior and that's really learned quickly within the environment as well so it's it's not just the genetic changes but also behavior yeah yeah i like that um uh, we'll jump to this this one that just popped in so based on epigenetics you know, I keep my heifers on the same pastures with their mom and rotate bulls between the two pastures i'm leaving bulls on all year and moving heifers to the opposite pasture once they're two if they look good i keep them so i guess um, yeah them. well i i can it, it depends on your context but i can talk about what we do so we do wean the heifers at 10 months old um, and then we separate uh until after calving and so we will put the heifers back with their with their mothers um after we finish calving and after they have properly pair bonded with their new calf and once they're back together we can run the bulls in with the cows and the heifers together we think it's really important that the heifers are developed in the same environment, just as they would be in nature, the same environment as their mothers. If you do have special heifer development, you're adding energy costs into there and you're potentially not creating a cow that thrives in that environment. Um, so I think that's really important. We put the heifers to the bull at 15 months old and then we carve them at two. I like it. I like it. That's good. Well, it's, it's neat to see that it, Kind of these principles are universal. It doesn't matter which side of the ocean you're on, which side of the world you're on. Um, this, this is pretty neat. So, Rob, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, if you um, want to drop in, okay, yep, she just she just dropped that in there. So, your breeding principles it looks like is your gift. Um, and does that include like contact information if people want to uh, get in contact with you? So sure. I mean, if you want to search up Phepps and Angus, that's P H E P S O N. Um, Phepps and Angus .com is our website. Uh, you okay. can find Phepps and Angus on Twitter and on Instagram, uh, also on Facebook. Um, I'd also really, uh, Clay Connery's just put a comment in um, Jan Bond's My Man Must Measure, which is a really important book to have a look at. Um, yeah. And yeah, uh, very much recommend having a look at that really important book well perfect that is great well thank you so much for jumping on the summit here for adding so much value um it just really ties right in with what we we're talking about about building a legacy business and cattle selection for those of us which is the majority of us on this call um or cattle producers so it really fits in so go ahead and uh give rob some gratitude in the chat let him know let him know what your takeaways are and feel free to answer any direct questions if you if they have them in the chat there, Rob. So. Great. Thank you very much. Real honor to be invited over to speak to you all and I wish you all the best with your breeding in the future. Perfect. Um.